But um, as you can see, I'm not Eric again. Eric is off on a much-needed vacation. Um, he has done a great job for us, but sometimes you just need rest. And that's where he's at this morning. So, but I want to tell you this morning, the, the topic that I am going to preach on this morning um, was given to me. Uh, when Eric asked me to preach this morning, he asked me, um, could you do me a favor? And I said, what's that? He said, there's a, there's a topic that I would love for you to preach on. And you're, you'll find out in a minute, I think, why he gave it to me. But if we could this morning, if you would, would you pray for with me? Father, this morning... Uh, we're grateful that we could gather as a church in your house because we're your church. And each one of us here this morning represent the church, Father, and we're grateful that, that we could gather as believers to be strengthened and encouraged because we can see there are other believers doing what you've asked us to do. So this morning, Father, as I always ask you and I've asked you for the last two weeks to to fill me with your Holy Spirit to give your word this morning. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. I don't think I'll ever forget. I was coaching at Lincoln College, and as I told you before, I was about, I'm, a, I'm a retired basketball coach. I, I've even went to the part that I am not even an armchair coach. I still enjoy the game. I don't like the NBA because it's not basketball any longer. We won't go there. We'll leave that subject alone. But I still like basketball. And if you know anything about basketball, as of being a coach, the same way ministers, ministers go to retreats to get encouraged and hear new things and to, to try new things. Well, I did that. I went to a clinic, and they gave us a whole bunch of sheet of papers. And if you've ever been to a clinic, normally what happens, there's about seven to eight Division I coaches that get up, and they tell you something important that they think about the game. Well, in one of those things was a, a piece of paper, and it was looking for coaches to volunteer to work Michael Jordan's camp. Well, it's Michael Jordan. So I go back to the college, and I fill out the sheet, and I, send it, I put it in the envelope that they'd even give to us with a prepaid postage on it. So I filled it out, I sent it back in, thinking there's a thousand of us probably trying to do this. But oh well, I'll try. So I sent it in. And about five days later, the phone rings in the basketball office and I pick it up and he said, Coach Unger? And I said, yeah. He said, this is Scott Trost. Well, I knew Scott because Scott was a coach at Elmer's College. And he recruited, recruited basically the same kind of kids that we did. And so we ran into each other out on the road recruiting. Now, I tell you all of that to tell you this. If you know basketball, you know who Michael Jordan is. They say he might be listed as the greatest player of all time. Well, he's pretty good. I would have to argue with you that Larry Bird might be the best player of all time. But anyway, I go to this camp. And one of the things that happens is we're in a meeting to start camp, and we've done all this stuff, and we got to do this and do this, and my only job was to coach one team, 
I didn't have to teach any sessions. I didn't have to teach any of that stuff. All I had to do was coach one team. And I thought, well, you know what? That's kind of funny. Because all these other guys got assigned to do this and this. And they had to go do this at check-in. And I'm sitting there going, that's kind of weird. But then I noticed there were four other guys that had the same assignment. They only had to coach one team. I began to think, well, you know what? The four of us are pretty special. Well, here's what happened when the meeting was over. Scott said, hey, Randy, John, Bill, Mike, and Mike, I need you to stick around. And then all of a sudden it's like, uh-oh, what's going on here? And so if you haven't noticed, I'm kind of large in stature. And what I also noticed is the other four guys were also large in statue. And I'm like... What's going on here? And he said, you guys have been chosen. I'm like, what do you mean we've been chosen? And he said, you're the five biggest coaches on our staff this week. <laughs> okay, thanks. But what does that mean, Scott? And he said, this is what that means. Anytime they called him Mike because they had known him and they knew him by first name and I could probably still do the same thing now because I, did, I worked at camp for six years. He said, but here's your assignment. Anytime Mike is in the building, you're with him. And what I, I'm like, with him? He said, yeah. He said, uh, you guys will form a circle around him and you'll walk wherever he goes. And then when he does this, uh, he did some teaching. And when he does some teaching... You five will stand around the court. Your job is not to let people touch him whatsoever. And I'm going to tell you, that is difficult. Because people worship the ground that Michael Jordan walked on because of what he could do with a basketball. Because of what he could do with a basketball, there were probably... The first week that I was there, the first session, there were 450 kids in that camp. In the first session. And it was a three-day part session. Every one of those kids had a Jordan. Red jersey, black jersey, white jersey. Some of them had the Looney Tune jerseys. The second session, which was another three days, there were 650 kids in that session. And every one of them had on jerseys that were Michael Jordan. But the craziest part about it is, is people just wanted to touch him. And so there were times that we literally had to lock arms to keep people from getting in to touch him because they worshipped the ground that he walked on because of what he could do with a basketball. So you see this morning, if you haven't figured it out yet, by the songs that we've sang and what I'm talking about this moment, the subject that Eric gave me to preach on this morning was worship. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you and be honest with you, I have battled with this for the last two weeks. And God and I have had some, I'm going to go ahead and say arguments, because I thought there was, he was leading me this way. And so I wrote the sermon the way I thought God was leading me. And then the next thing you know, I was in our room where the desk is at, where the computer was at. And what I knew next is I had destroyed the sermon that I had already wrote. And if you know, I'm not a very good typer. My wife says, you need me to type that? No, no, no. Because I don't even let her know what I'm preaching because I tell it's between me and God. Until it comes here, it's between me, you, and God. So I tore it up. And I started over. Because you see right now, Worship is a really, really hard subject in the church. And so, I did something, if you bear with me for just a moment, I didn't want to do this on my own. So I called a couple of friends of mine, plus I sat down with Eric, and I asked Eric, I said, you know, since you give me this topic and you're going on vacation, you're not getting out of this. So if you're bear with me for just a second, this is what Pastor Eric said about worship. He said, 
my description of worship, if I were to sum it up in one sentence, I would say it is the praise and adoration of God and the power of the Holy Spirit for the work He has done in and through Jesus Christ. Get ready to laugh for a second. Now, you all know me well, and I don't say anything in just one sentence. So I had to abbreviate the next part of it because it was about six pages long. So let me explain quickly, Eric said. So the description is most identical to what Jesus says true worship is in John 4. In these verses, God is spirit and truth. Worship is more than singing praise, praise song. It's more than saying a prayer. It's more than reading your favorite Bible verse. Worship is all those things and much more. But if done apart from the Spirit, it is not true worship. It can be done individually or corporately. Both are biblical and right, and neither can be done apart from the Spirit of God dwelling in us. Okay, I can quit preaching right there because that's it. Okay, but what I did is I called one of my college teammates, Mike Perriman, who recently has been the interim youth minister over at West Frank, but normally he's an elder down at Woodlawn Christian Church. And this is what Mike did the same thing. Mike sent me this three page, and I said, Mike, I said, let's scale it down a little bit. He said, okay, I'll give it to you like this. The scripture clarifies worship is simply not just singing, but it's also preaching, and teaching, witnessing. He said, but more important than anything is to honor God with all I do with a heart close to Him. Okay, but I didn't stop there. I called another teammate of mine named Tracy Thomas. Tracy was the guy on our team. When I read this to you, you're going to know he helped our GPA. Tracy right now is the director of alumni services at Lincoln Christian University. And this is what Tracy wrote. Worship is to fill in your heart and express some ap- apparate manner, humbling but delight sense of admiring awe and astonished wonder and overpowering love in the presence of the most majesty, which philosophers call the first cause, but which we call our Father which art in heaven. So I would say the reason I worship is because there is nothing in myself that is capable of overwhelming wonder that God is. Tracy ended with this. I worship God because nothing else will ever do. I could stop preaching right there. But I called another friend of mine. His name is David Vaughn. David Vaughn went to Lincoln Christian University, was on the baseball team. David now is the chaplain down at Robinson, Illinois, at the correctional facility, but he also worship, is the, worship, the, leader, the lead pastor at a little small church in Hudsonville, Illinois. David has quite the sense of humor. And when I ask him, this is what I got back. To lick God's face. That's what I got back. You know, and I sat there for a second. I'm going, David, David, you're not helping me at all. Not at all, David, you're not helping me. But then the longer I sat there, well, yeah, he did. He helped out a lot. Because he sent me another text and said, okay, you're laughing, aren't you? And by this point, I was laughing. And he said, go to Strong's. In Strong's, the Hebrew word you found in Strong, it says, like a dog seeks his master's face. It's the greatest compliment. The offering you can get. And if you have dogs... You know exactly what I'm talking about. We happen to have two German shepherds at home. One's three and one's two. You have to look real close to find out that they're who's who most of the time. People can't get, keep them straight. But when you walk in the house, they greet you and they want to lick you. And then they want to give you their paw. And you see, that's great honor. 
Because when a dog will do that to you, it shows you, to you as a human that they as a dog love you. So you see, to worship God truly, David may not be wrong. It may be to lick God's face. And some of you this morning are standing there going, Randy, have you lost your mind? I just might have. But that's a whole other story. So you see, worship is a feeling of expression, of reverence, and adoration to God. You see, even you go to the Bible, even the devil gave reverence to God. You see, if you go to Mark chapter 5, there's a story about a man named Legion. But you see, what happened is in chapter 4 in John, I mean in Mark, Jesus had been doing some teaching. And he says, let's go. Now you see, if I'm, if I'm one of the disciples, what I'm thinking in my mind, it doesn't say this in the Bible, but what I'm thinking in my mind is he just was teaching over a th- to a thousand people. Everywhere he went, there were multiple crowds that gathered to listen to Jesus' teaching. So the disciples get in the boat, and I'm thinking, if I'm one of the disciples, what's going through my mind is the simple fact that there was just a thousand. The disciples look at each other going, hey, we're going over here, and there's going to be about 50,000. There's going to be about 50,000 people over there. But what happens when the disciples get there with Jesus, I think the disciples at first had to be just a little bit disappointed because there was only one man. And in that, it says he was not in his right mind. They had tried to shackle him. He was so strong that he would break the shackles. He would break them apart. They couldn't keep him contained. It said that he would cut himself with rocks day and night. And I tell you that so you understand this. When Jesus stepped out of the boat onto the land, this man named Legion runs to Jesus and goes down to his knees. And this is what this man says. Jesus, Son of the Most High, what do you want with me? He was possessed with over 2,000 demons. Which if we don't have time to go there, what demons are are part of Satan. They're part of the devil. They're part of the evil. But the evil even recognized who Jesus was and gave Him adoration for who He was. But you see, if we go a little bit farther into Luke, what we find out is Mary's pregnant. The Holy Spirit came upon her, told her, the angel, we all know the story of how Mary found out that she was going to have a baby. Mary goes to visit a cousin. Her name is Elizabeth. Elizabeth is with child, which we know later is going to be John the Baptist. And when Mary walked into the room with Elizabeth, John the Baptist, who was in her womb, leaped. He showed reverence to Jesus. So you see what happens this morning is as we talk about worship, there's sometimes there's a controversy. Some people say there's worship and then there's praise. And some would say that worship is that of just singing slower songs. And then they would say that a praise is where you lift your hands and you close your eyes and you dance. Well, worship's all of that and much more. And as we break this down this morning, when we get to the end of this, I may make some of you question yourself this morning. But you see, if, if you sum it up As Eric said, if you go to John chapter 4, 
And you start with verse 19. This is what it says. It says, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship which you do not... Hang on. I got a new Bible and it's uh, pages stick together. But I had to do that because I'm getting old and I can't read. So, We worship what you do not know for salvation is for the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit and His worshipers must worship in Spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ. He is coming. And when He comes, He will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am He. So you see what has to happen is in order to have true worship, you have to worship in spirit and in truth. Well, you say, well, how do I do that? Well, you see, when you confess to be a Christian and you go into that water and you get baptized, some churches don't say it, but it's true. You get baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins, but there's one more part of that that some churches leave out and I don't understand why. And that's the gift of the Holy Spirit. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit when you become a Christian. And so if you're going to worship, you have to worship in the Spirit. You see, it's got to be filled inside of you. 100% engaged in your worship is what the Holy Spirit allows you to do. You see, when it comes to singing, what happens is some people say, well, I can't sing in church because I don't sound good. Well, if you're filled with the Spirit and you're worshiping the God Almighty, it doesn't matter what you or the person next to you sounds like because you're showing reverence to God because you're filled with the Spirit. Well, there's another side of that, is that that's the truth. What is the truth? Why do we worship God? Because of who He is. That's simple. I mean, that, that, that's the simplest way you can say it. It's because of who He is. You worship because this morning you got up and you were given life. You worship this morning because there was either eggs or bacon or cereal on your table because God provided for you is why you worship. That's the truth. But the truth, more of the fact and the truth is that Jesus, He allowed His own Son to come to this earth and to die for you that you may have eternal life. You see, so we worship because we're filled with the Spirit and we worship because we're full of the truth of who Jesus Christ is and who God is. you got to believe and mean what you say. It can't be a show. And you see, that's where we come to now. And this, this is where I've struggled. Because you see, the, some would call them the methods of worship. How do I do that? Well, we do that individually. And then we also do that corporately. Because I, I can worship however I want. But I also need to be encouraged and strengthened to see that I have other believers that worship with me. So you see, it doesn't matter where you worship and how, it's that you do. And you see, when we come together and and to worship, there are different ways that we can even do that. You see, I have to tell you, I grew up in a church, I grew up in a Christian church, but when we got up to sing in church, it was, okay, turn your hymnals to page 320, 
and we are going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Now we're going to turn your hymnals to page 420, and we're going to sing the first and last verse. That's what I was accustomed to. Well, I went to Bible college, and every Tuesday and Thursday, we had to go to chapel. And I'll never forget this either. The first day we're in chapel, I'm sitting with a couple of my teammates, and about four rows down from us is a row of girls. Well, you obviously know what freshmen in college, what we were doing in chapel, to know that four rows exactly from us were the girls. But as we began to sing, what I noticed was I seen a girl do this. And I remember thinking to myself, what's she doing? Why is she doing that? I didn't say anything to her. I let it go. On Thursday, we go back to chapel, and what I see again as we begin to sing, that same row of girls, now there's about three of them raising their hand up. I'm still a little naive about this. I'm not quite sure what they're doing. And I begin to think to myself, are they just making a, a show? So, being the investigative guy that I am, next Tuesday, we go to chapel. And my buddies are sitting in that same row, and four rows in front of us are those same girls. And I walk past the row that I sit in. And my teammate Andy says, hey, where are you going? I said, I'm going down here. He says, what are you doing? I said, I'm going down here. I said, come on down here with me. Uh-uh. I said, come on, come down here with me. But he didn't want to do it. And then my friend Brian walks down. He goes, Randy, he says, what are you doing? And I said, I'm investigating. <laughs> he said, you're, you're, you're investigating? I said, yeah, I'm doing some investigating. He shook his head and went and sat down. And when we started to sing, I wasn't worshiping because I was in my chair and I was doing this. Actually, it's a pew, and I do this, and I do this. What I found out is those girls were worshiping God because they weren't just putting their hands up. They had their hands up, and their eyes were closed, and they were singing. And what I remember that day was it was one of the most beautiful things that I've ever witnessed because it wasn't a show. So you see, it's okay to raise your hand and worship. You know, we've seen, all of us have probably seen the video that goes around as, well, okay, okay, no. Okay, no. Okay, I'm not going to do it today. The next week we come back, no, because you think it's embarrassing. Well, it's not embarrassing at all. It's absolutely showing reverence to God. And if you're not comfortable with that, that's okay. But it's not okay for you not to be uncomfortable for somebody else to do it. Because you see, we use our hands in reverence and we use our voice in reverence to God. And you see, like I said, you can do that anywhere. And as preachers, sometimes we're allowed to tell stories about ourselves and whether you want to hear it or not, you get to hear it. And this is one of those places where I wasn't going to say this. And I wrote it out even after I typed it yesterday. Well, Friday, I'm sorry. I tore this part out and I threw it away again. But for some reason, God kept saying, no, I'm asking you to tell this story. So you see, you all know a couple, as a matter of fact, in June, I had a little condition with my heart. And I had a doctor tell me the next 24 hours are crucial, Randy. Actually, he said Mr. Unger. And when he said Mr. Unger to me, I knew something was wrong. He said, we're going to do everything we can do, but the next 24 hours are crucial. So I did the only thing I knew to do. First of all, I called my wife. When I was able, they got me steady and I told her what was going on. 
My wife then in turn calls my mother. My mother then in turn calls the church. And then a friend of mine that I went to high school with, her mother goes to the same church still with my mom. She found out about it. She called her church. And then Ann called Bonnie. Bonnie called the church. People began to pray. The doctor walked back in the room and he put his hand on my arm just like this. And he said, you're getting better. We're not out of the woods yet, but we're getting better. He said, we can not worry about the 24 hours any longer. And this is what he said to me. As he walked out of the room, this is the last words he said that day to me. He said, God must be on your side. And as he walked out, I'm like, you're right, Doc. I still can't say his name right. Dr. Mo Windsor, she's back there laughing right now because I can't say it. I'm like, you are right. He is on my side. And you see, I was in a hospital bed in Heartland Regional Hospital in ICU in the most uncomfortable bed that I've ever laid in in my entire life. So I wasn't laying down, but I wasn't completely setting up. But when he said to me, God must be on your side, I said, you're right. God is on my side. And I began to do the only thing that I knew how to do. And I put my hands up. And I began to sing, Jesus loves me. It wasn't very pretty because I don't sing well. But you see, I raised my hands because who God Almighty is. I raised my hands because there were Christian people who cared enough about me to go to our God in reverence and pray on my behalf. And then when I got done with that song, I started singing, I'm going to raise a hallelujah. Because I was in the middle of a storm. But no matter what, God was going to carry me through that storm because I had people on my side that were going to Him on my behalf. So it does not matter where you're at. If you want to raise your hands to God, you raise your hands to God. If you want to play an instrument, you play an instrument. And if you don't think that's biblical, turn to Psalms 150. And let me read this for you. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise Him in the mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His surpassing sounds. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and the lyre. Praise Him with the timbre, the tremble and dancing. Praise Him with the strings and the pipe. Praise Him with the clash of sounds. Praise Him with the rescinding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So you see, it's biblical. It's biblical to have a guitar. It's biblical to have a keyboard. As long as it's done showing reverence to God. And when you do it, your heart is that way. You see, you can pray and worship to God. You can just stand there. If that's what you want to do, you may not have to, to utter a word out of your mouth. But if you're standing there in the reverence of God, you're worshiping Him. You can close your eyes. And it's okay. Revelations chapter 4. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and back. The first living creature was a lion, like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face of a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around. Even under their, their wings, day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You see, even there in heaven, 
I don't know I've ever seen a creature look like that. But they were showing reverence to the Lord God Almighty. One day we'll get to go there and do that, but why not do it now? You see, I, I won't go as far as saying that we should go to this, but dancing's biblical in worship. David danced before the Lord. I don't know what kind of dance it was, but David danced before the Lord. I can't dance, so that's one part of my worship you won't see because I can't dance. I might be able to do a little slow dance with my wife at a wedding party, but that's as close as it gets. But you see, it, it all comes down to that worship is an inward belief that we're showing outward. And when you show that outward, like I said, you're giving reverence to God. But you see, this morning at this point, we've talked about our personal worship and how we can do it with lifting hands. We can do it with our voice. We can do it with our prayers. But you see, we also can do it by the way we serve. And you, what do you mean by that, Randy? Well, it's kind of like this, and it's a Saturday, and, and Margie calls you and she says, Hey, I made extra cookies. Would you like some? Well, you don't have to ask me twice if I would like some cookies. But you see, she made the cookies and then on Sunday morning, last Sunday, she brought them to church in an ice cream bucket. I don't know who's getting them today or if that's what's in the bucket, but I've seen the bucket come back in the church this morning. But you see, I'm just really getting to know Margie, but I know that's done with a heart for God because she loves to serve. And when you love to serve, you're showing reference to God. And I'm, not, I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one in this congregation that's got some type of an encouragement card from her either. She is really, really good at doing that. And when she does that, she worships God because she's showing reverence because she cares. The guys in the sound booth, when they go up there Sunday after Sunday and they get things right, that's an act of worship because they're doing it out of reverence for God. When we check in on the shut-ins that can't make it to church, that's an act of worship because we're doing it out of reverence for God. You see, the list can go on and on. I bet you some of you are sitting there thinking, well, yeah, that can be and that can be. You're right, it can be. Your active services can be done if it's in reverence to God and it's worship. So you see, no matter where you're at, how you do it, it's worship. Individually is important. Corporate is important. But you see, one of my questions to you this morning is, how do you perceive God yourself? And what I want to do this morning, if you're better with me, the guys upstairs are going to play a song. And then when they're done with that song, I'll close. But what I want you to do this morning is if you want to close your eyes, close your eyes. If you want to raise your hand in worship, raise your hand in worship. But listen to the words of this song. It's supposed to be in Shutterfly.
I think they're figuring it out. Jesse's on his way up to help as well. I am, we apologize for the, the pause here, but I really want you to listen to this song so that we can close out. I don't know if you know the history of that song, but that's Mercy Me. 
And the gentleman who wrote that song had a very, very hard childhood. His dad used to beat him, wasn't a Christian, but at the end his dad became a Christian and Bart wrote this song. And what I began to think about this week as I've listened to this song probably about 30 times at least to the point that uh, my wife thought that I was going to sing. Because last night uh, she was in the living room watching a, a show and I went into the bedroom and I was, I was looking over my notes again trying to make sure I was prepared. And just, you'd be proud of me that I knew that that was on Shutterfly because I'm, I'm not very good with the technology. But I do know how to put the headphones in my ear and plug it into my phone and hit play. So, I was in my room last night, well, in the, the room where the desk is at, and I'd plugged it in, and I was listening to music, the song, and I didn't realize I was singing as loud as I was singing. And evidently, she yelled at me a couple of times from the other room, and because I had my headphones in, I couldn't hear her. And my phone rings, and it's my wife. Because you see, when my phone rings, the picture of my beautiful wife shows up on my screen. And she goes, you're not going to sing tomorrow, are you? <laughs> uh, no, no. I said, I'm just drowning out your show so that I can concentrate. And I began to think to myself, as great as that song is, and as great as it is going to be to one day to stand in front of God, in heaven, and to be able to raise my hands and worship Him right there, and to be in awe and wonder of His glory. Why can't I do it here? Why can't we do it here? Why can't we worship and be in awe and wonder of His glory right now? And the easiest way to do that is to worship. You see, this morning in California, I don't know if you're paying attention to what's going on, but they told them they can't have church. You can't have church. You can't go to a building. You can't go to an outside. You can't gather as a church. And if you do, you're going to be labeled with the misdemeanor. But there's a pastor in California this morning that said, Go ahead. Go ahead. For the first thousand people that come into that congregation today, they're going to slap them with a misdemeanor. And you know what? They don't care. Because you know what they're about to do this morning? They're about to worship. You see, if you haven't figured it out, church, right now, Satan is raising his voice. And he's trying to take over. He's trying to get the church shut down. He's trying to get the church separated. It's our job as Christians not to allow that to happen. What our job this morning is to do is worship the Lord God Almighty with every ounce of our being. By ourselves individually and as the church. To worship to worship, to worship. Father, this morning, for me and I, I believe a bunch of others, Father, it's hard not to show you reverence. It's hard not to worship you because of the things that you do for us, for the jobs that you provide, the food that you provide for the healings that you provide. But Father, it's hard not to worship most of all because you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, down here to go through so much pain and agony that our sins can be forgiven. And one day, 
whenever you're ready, one day when you call us home to be able to continue our worship face to face. So this morning, Father, my prayer is that that as a church, and not this, this church, Father, but the church nationwide, that we worship you in the manner of which you deserve. Father, because of you and through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, we ask these things in his name. Amen. Jesse, are there any announcements that we need to